Asia America is brought to you by Asian America Voice, championing diversity, the very best way to connect people. Where's the best place for beef and bop? Les Jeux Olympiques d'hiver se dérouleront-ils à Pyeongchang? هل أنتم حقا سابع أكبر مصدر في العالم؟ Hello and welcome to Asian America, the leading public television show about Asia and Asian Americans. For this special show, I am your host, Alexandra Toma. I am the executive director of the Connect US Fund, and more importantly for this show, I am also the co-chair of the Fissile Materials Working Group, which is a global coalition of over 60 organizations and experts focused on nuclear security and providing real solutions to the threat of nuclear terrorism. Today, I am joined by my colleagues, Ms. Corey Hinterstein and Mr. Ken Luongo. They are experts in their own right in nuclear security and will be discussing the upcoming 2012 Seoul Nuclear Security Summit and the importance of nuclear security. Ken Luongo is also the president of the Partnership for Global Security. He is going to be speaking at the Seoul uh, Experts Symposium following the, uh, uh, preceding the Nuclear Security Summit. And Corey Hinterstein is the Vice President of International Programs at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, NTI, which recently released an NTI index following nuclear security issues. All three of us will be at the Seoul uh, Summit and look forward to discussing these important issues. But before we do, let's take a look at a short video about the Seoul Security Summit. disappear in a moment. Terrorism is not a problem confined to a single nation. And if nuclear power is used in terrorism, humanity will face irreparable disaster. Nuclear terrorism is reality. We must assemble and discuss a resolution on the tragic situation that confronts humanity. Since then, mankind has made concerted efforts towards the peaceful uses of nuclear materials. And we know that there is unsecured nuclear material across the globe. To protect our people, we must act with a sense of purpose, without delay. Today I am announcing a new international effort to secure all vulnerable nuclear material around the world within four years. In accordance with this initiative, the first Nuclear Security Summit was held in Washington, D.C. in April 2010. The assembled world leaders found common ground on the objective of preventing nuclear terrorism, one of the most challenging threats to international security in the 21st century. Terrorism 중에서도 가장 강화할 형태는 바로 핵무기를 사용한 테러일 것입니다. 핵테러를 막기 위한 국가 간 긴밀한 협력이 그 어느 때보다도 절실합니다. And in 2012, leaders from over 50 nations and heads of four international organizations will come together. We will gather in Korea, a country that diligently adheres to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, to discuss practical measures for securing nuclear and radiological materials, protecting nuclear facilities, and preventing the illegal trade of nuclear materials.
different cultures, different faces, different thoughts. But the one thing that the seven billion people in the world wish for is peace. A more peaceful and safer world begins in 2012. 2012 Seoul Nuclear Security Summit. So let's start with you, Ken. Can you tell us a little bit about nuclear terrorism? Is nuclear terrorism a real threat? Yes, nuclear terrorism is a real threat. It's something that international organizations like the United Nations and the International Atomic Energy Agency, as well as a number of governments from around the world, have indicated is one of the top threats to international security. The challenge is to convince people that you can take the material and uh, make a bomb out of it. And the experts have indicated that it's entirely possible and it's something that we need to worry about. It's a low probability event, but it's a high consequence event and it's something very serious. That's why the summit is very important. And Corey, are there any examples you can give us about um, some of the risks and threats that we've seen around nuclear security? There have been a number of incidents of nuclear smuggling where nuclear material, highly enriched uranium or plutonium, the key ingredient for a nuclear weapon, have been found on the black market, including most recently in the fall of 2011, where highly enriched uranium was captured and at least one of the perpetrators who was trying to sell that material was never found and is believed to still have some highly enriched uranium, although not enough to make a nuclear weapon by itself. The scariest thing is that highly enriched uranium and plutonium, most of it when it has been caught and been um, identified by the International Atomic Energy Agency and other international organizations, the institutes where this material came from never even knew it was missing. So we don't even know how big the problem is, how much material may be out there, but we know that the easiest way to prevent nuclear terrorism is to secure material where it exists. It's much harder to find it after it's gone. You mentioned um, that these incidents have happened um, you know, across the world, uh, but a lot of people when they hear about terrorism, they think, well, oh, that's, a, that's an American problem, that's an American issue. Um, so Ken, can you tell us a little bit about your views on that? Yeah, I think the biggest misconception is that the nuclear weapon states which have the largest amount of this material are somehow the largest targets. In fact, facilities that have even small amounts of, say, highly enriched uranium uh, for civilian purposes, not for military purposes, that are unsecured are actually a bigger threat because it doesn't take that much material to make the weapon in an improvised form, and it also is Places where security is less rigorous um, are at civilian locations rather than military reservations. So, uh, yeah, it's not a problem just for the weapon states. It's a problem for all uh, nations that have this material. But secondarily, it's quite important because if there's a uh, terrorist event, there's going to be an economic impact, and it's going to be especially devastating to developing countries and countries that are export dependent. Corey, can you tell us a little bit more about the civilian side of where these um, materials lie and why is that more of a, uh, potentially more of a risk than, uh, than the military side? Well, we know that highly enriched uranium and plutonium, the key ingredients for weapons, are found in weapons and in those nine states that have nuclear weapons. But these materials mm. are also found in, in more than two dozen other countries. And in those cases, they are used in civilian nuclear power programs. Uh, they are used in nuclear research. They are used to produce medical isotopes, the kind of materials that really help and benefit mankind. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we historically had spread this material around for these civilian purposes without thinking of the potential terrorist consequences. One of the benefits of the current debate and one of the areas where the Nuclear Security Summit is really making a contribution is in getting states to recognize that they don't need these materials anymore, to get rid of the materials, but not to, to lose the opportunity of gaining the peaceful benefits of, the, of these materials. So it's important to identify other material, like low enriched uranium, which is a much 
lower threat. In fact, I would say poses almost no threat at all. And making sure that those materials are the ones used for medical, agricultural, and other uses. Got it. So let's let's talk about the Nuclear Security Summit a little bit. Um, you both mentioned it and talked about um, the importance of the Nuclear Security Summit. So what, what is, Ken, what is the Nuclear Security Summit? The, the Nuclear Security Summit in Seoul is the second version of this new summit that was announced by President Obama in his speech at Prague in 2009. And so the president said that he was going to launch an initiative around the world sec to secure all vulnerable nuclear materials in four years. And so the summit was the first step in Washington, was the first step toward that goal. And at that summit, it was decided that there would be a second summit in Seoul. And now in advance of the Seoul summit, it's been announced that there'll be a third summit in the Netherlands. So we have a process of events where national leaders are coming together to talk about two basic things. One, the importance of preventing nuclear terrorism, top priority. And then secondly, how do we improve the security of these materials so that terrorists can never get access to them so that we don't have to deal with the consequences of a terrorist activity. So that's what these are about. They're high-level meetings of political leaders from over 50 countries. I think in Seoul there's 53 different national leaders that are coming. Uh, and the idea is to build a global consensus against nuclear terrorism and then as strong a barrier as possible against it. And Corey, what, um, can you tell us a little bit about what happened at the 2010 Nuclear Security Summit in Washington? Well, the 2010 Washington Summit really was historic. It was the first time that leaders came together to talk about the issue of nuclear security and the prevention of nuclear terrorism. There are a lot of other treaties and, uh, and venues to discuss other areas of nuclear threat, whether it be the proliferation of nuclear weapons, nuclear safety, or other issues related to uh, the nuclear arena. But nuclear security had never had such a focus. So these leaders, 47 countries and three international organizations, came together and they had really three sets of uh, products out of the summit. The first was a communique. This was a high-level political commitment recognizing the reality of the nuclear terrorist threat, which we have to remember, Ken described that threat, but until the 2010 Nuclear su uh, Security Summit, there really hadn't been as wide a consensus that the threat was real or even that a nuclear terrorist event was possible. So that was the important first step. There was also a work plan that listed many different things that states could do to help improve their own nuclear security approaches. And again, as Ken said, all states have a stake in this, not just in the consequence, but in preventing it. Even if they are not the state in which nuclear material is located, they might be the state where material is transported through, or the state where a terrorist organization might use the nuclear material to put together a device. So all states are important uh, in this chain. And then the third was a set of what were called house gifts. And these house gifts were what each country brought to Washington and made a commitment to do. So some of them were related to um, support for the International Atomic Energy Agency or signing a treaty such as the Convention on Physical Protection of Nuclear Materials or the Nuclear Terrorism Convention, um, or in some cases, uh, Ukraine, Chile. These were states that um, made a commitment to or announced that they had given up all of the nuclear material that was on their territory. So there were real gains, but the biggest progress was simply coming together, agreeing on the threat, and having some sort of a forward program. And so it sounds like there was a lot put on the table. There were a lot of um, benchmarks out there. So looking at the 2012 Seoul Nuclear Security Summit, Ken, what, what has actually been accomplished so far? Well, I think the biggest accomplishments have been the house gifts that Corey mentioned, which are the individual commitments that nations <coughs> made about what they were going to do on their own territory. And I think somewhere in the range of over 75% of those commitments have been implemented. Some of them haven't um, yet been implemented and may be over the next few weeks. But there's been good progress on that part of it. The communique uh, was 
had a lot of detail in it, but not a lot of requirement that nations actually adhere to the specific elements of it. It was much more voluntary. So I think that uh, some of that has been accomplished, not all of it, and I'm hopeful that in Seoul that document will be um, improved and made a little bit stronger and have some requirement that we, we help improve the system and that countries uh, be required to take steps to improve their security. Great. So let's, let's focus now a little bit on the Seoul summit itself. Um, Corey, in your opinion, why, why do you think Korea was, was chosen to host the summit? Well, first and foremost, Korea volunteered, and I think that this, uh, from what I heard from those who were in the room, uh, the states were, were very welcoming of this uh, South Korean um, effort and, um, and South Korea putting itself forward as a leader. Mm -hmm. This is really consistent with where South Korea has positioned itself on these issues in the past few years, and it comes from both a political leadership as well as a commercial leadership standpoint. On the political leadership, South Korea has really recognized that as a, a really fully emerged um, democracy and economy in East Asia, it can play a very significant leadership role on the nuclear issue as well as the broader uh, regional security issues. Um, at the same time, South Korea is trying to, and in some cases has already succeeded in, becoming an exporter of nuclear technology. Um, South Korea is the fifth largest user of nuclear energy for electricity production in the world, but they are now looking to sell their reactors abroad, and they have done so with the United Arab Emirates buying a reactor from them. And so as South Korea looks to be a commercial player, their um, kind of political bona fides, their, their political leadership is even more important on issues of security and nonproliferation to make sure that they're in the strongest stead possible um, as they uh, are really playing on this arena. In South Korea, Ken, do you expect the same type of agenda to be on, on the table as we've had um, at the 2010 summit? Are there new things that are going to be talked about? What, what's it going to be about? I think the core of the summit is going to be the same as Washington in a sense that the prevention of nuclear terrorism will be the key, the key issue. And I think that everyone will be focused on that. But there are going to be a few other additional issues that are on the agenda. Uh, the first of which is the fallout from Fukushima and what the interface, as people are calling it, between nuclear safety, which is how you make reactors operate safely, and nuclear security, which is very different, which is about the protection of the materials, interact together. And the reason is because there's a general sense that if the Fukushima accident was an intentional act of terrorism, um, the system is not adequately prepared to deal with that those consequences and those implications. So that's going to be one very important issue, and it, and it goes to what Corey said about the commercial aspects of commercial of nuclear power, because uh, there's a desire, I think, to improve the safety and security of nuclear power installations so that they're viewed as safe sources of energy as the population on the globe increases as resources for oil and gas begin to decrease. And so that's a very important objective. The second issue, new issue that will be on the agenda is related to radiological security. Radiological security is very different than nuclear security. Nuclear security is about the materials that you can make a nuclear bomb out of. They're big, a nuclear bomb is, you know, reasonably large, especially a improvised one. And radiological sources, especially high intensity radiological sources that are used in hospitals and things like that, from which you can make a dirty bomb, are incredibly small. In fact, one radiological source is not much bigger than your thumb. And if you surround that with some explosive, you will contaminate some significant amount of a city and it will be uninhabitable until it's cleaned up and it will be expensive, it will be economically um, devastating and it will not allow people to live in that zone. So those two issues are new on the agenda. There are a few others that um, are more technical, but I think that, that those are gonna take not equal uh, place to nuclear terrorism, but second and third. And Corey, you, I know you work a lot in, in the region um, and certainly on the industry side as well. And you mentioned that there, there's going to be an industry summit as well um, around the nuclear uh, security summit. Are there other um, 
issues that you think might pop up. Um, you mentioned nuclear power. Um, mm -hmm. Ken mentioned radiological um, issues. Of course, North Korea is is the big elephant in the room. Um, you know, will North Korea be talked about? If so, how? What? Mm -hmm. How does that play into specifically the Seoul Security Summit? North Koreans will not participate in the Seoul Nuclear Security Summit, and I don't expect that the North Korean nuclear issue, um, as a primarily a proliferation issue, will be um, a central uh, point of discussion for the summit and the summit participants. And nor will the issue of Iran, for example, which is another kind of hot proliferation issue in the world. We have a situation where, you know, some people want this summit to be all things and cover all issues, and it really can't. For this summit to be valuable, it needs to keep its focus on n preventing nuclear terrorism primarily and some of these um, related issues of radiological terrorism and the safety security interface, for example, where, where that all is contributive to a discussion of nuclear terrorism. We all agree that North Korea, Iran, uh, nuclear disarmament, um, broader issues are important, but this is not the venue to deal with all of those issues. That being said, I would expect that you know any time when you get this many leaders together, there are likely to be some very interesting discussions on the margins, and I think there may be opportunities in Seoul to make progress on issues such as the North Korean uh, nuclear issue, but not in the formal summit setting. Mm -hmm. What are some expected outcomes of the summit? What can we expect? What, um, what you know, can you talk about progress? Seventy-five percent um, or more of accomplishments have have been completed. Um, what else can we expect to see in terms of uh, uh, outcomes from this Seoul Security Summit? Well, I think again at this summit, the individual national commitments, the so-called house gifts, will be probably the most tangible. There's going to be something new this year, which is called gift baskets, which is groups of nations making similar commitments that are grouped together, which I think is actually a very useful innovation uh, from Washington. And then there'll be another communique. I expect, again, the communique to lay out um, some of the key issues without requiring compliance with them. And I expect the house gifts and the gift baskets to be uh, the most concrete. But I think uh, equally important to the outcome of the summit is what happens after the summit, and that is what, what leadership role the Korean government and the U.S. government and other governments are going to play leading into the next summit in the Netherlands, and whether or not we can try to close some of the gaps that exist in the, in the regime that governs nuclear security, and whether by the end of that process in Amsterdam or wherever it may be in the Netherlands, uh, that we've made some real progress on, on unifying and strengthening nuclear security regime overall. So, Corey, um, go Yeah, ahead. my expectations are, um, are rather ambitious for this summit, and that's partially because I think if this, progress, if this process is going to continue, it has to be stronger every time. It's not enough to rehash what we did in Washington. Mm -hmm. And while there are a number of very important individual commitments and places where states have grouped together, the real significant issue is can we establish a set of priorities on nuclear security issues for the global agenda as a whole? And I think until we do that, we're going to have these pockets of progress. Each one may be important, but it doesn't lead to an overall significant su and sustainable improvement and reducing the risk of nuclear terrorism to the point uh, where we really need it to go. And I think so, this vision for the future will be what I'm really hoping to see out of the Nuclear Security Summit in Seoul. No question. Vision is the key, and Seoul has got to be the pivot point toward the vision. Yes. Washington was easy to call a success because it was the first of its kind, and it actually achieved some modest progress. Well, last question for both of you. Um, what can citizens do to be involved? We've talked a lot about what officials and governments can do and what, what the expectations are, what has been accomplished, but what can citizens do? What can people watching at home do? Well, there are two things. One is that the summit itself is going to be surrounded by two other events. And let me just talk about, about one of them, um, which is the expert symposium. This is an international symposium of experts that are coming to Seoul on the Friday before the summit 
to talk about issues related to nuclear terrorism and nuclear security. Um, they will be from all different countries. The audience is from a variety of different countries, including representatives from all of the countries that will be at the uh, summit in Seoul. And the topic is going to be what the um, non-governmental community, the expert community, and citizens can do to assist governments with their nuclear terrorism um, prevention objectives. The second event is for the nuclear industry to come together because, of course, where the implementation is, where the rubber hits the road on nuclear security, it has to be done at the facility level with the nuclear industry. The other final thing is leaders won't come together if they don't think their citizens care about this issue. So leaders need to hear that citizens think this is important and think it's worth their time. Great. Well, thank you both for being here. Thank you for the viewers at home for watching. I'm Alexandra Toma for Asian America presenting to you today. If you have any comments or suggestions, please write to Asian America, care of WNYE TV, 112 Tillery Street, Brooklyn, New York, 11201, or email us at AsianAmerica at AOL.com and visit our website, www.AsianAmerica.com. Asia America is brought to you by Asian America Voice, championing diversity, the very best way to connect people.